Hi, dear Dao London friends. Today we are going to talk about the Zoyi, or better known as the I Ching to most people. And we're going to talk a little bit about its history and its purpose as being described from the uh, Zhou dynasty, uh, which is succeeding the uh, Shang dynasty and preceding the Qin dynasty. Uh, as you maybe know from your history lessons on the I Ching, the Qin dynasty tried to burn the I Ching and because of the wisdom of certain kind of scholars, they managed to convince the emperor not to do that. And this is the reason why we still know about the I Ching other than from references and that we actually have uh, also found several texts that are completing our ideas about the I Ching. The popular I Ching, as you can find in the bookstores, is usually not the I Ching as it is intended to be. What I always teach to my children and what I teach to my students and what has been denied by several of my uh, friend adepts of the I Ching is that the I Ching is primarily a visual aid to understand reality. <laughs> you have to understand that in that time, although there was written language, written language was not the most important things. You have to see the I Ching a little bit like the glass and lead windows in churches, in the sense that it was actually trying to convey reality through images. And these images were being put at a certain point in the form of a paqua, and we're going to talk a little bit about that too. At the moment when we look at the beginning of the I Ching and what people said about it in the Zhou dynasty, you can clearly understand what the I Ching is about. So what I want to start with is with a citation. I'm going to explain it a little bit and then I'm going to go to a second citation. The one is from the book of Shang, uh, that is about the Shang dynasty, a historical uh, treatise. There's a lot of things in there, also about Taoism and all kind of other stuff, so it's an important book to read, but very unknown in the West. And there is a uh, citation from Mao Tse. Mao Tse is a very famous uh, Chinese philosopher who was absorbed with his philosophy into Taoism and is momentarily rekindled by the Chinese Communist Party. Mao Tse explained reality in its whole in a similar kind of fashion as Lao Tzu did in the sense that it described the world in three realms and it talked a little bit about what uh, these realms contain and how we should deal with it and actually talking about the I Ching was part of that so this is why I couldn't resist using this translation also in this text so what I think what I suggest and what I advise you to do is to watch this video all the way to the end, especially when you're interested in the I Ching, or if you're interested in studying the I Ching, or even if you're interested in becoming a counselor in the I Ching. For all these things, we have a two-year course, which is also a foundational text and a foundational course for studying Chinese medicine, because diagnosis in Chinese medicine is based on the I Ching. Uh, when you talk about martial arts, Tai Chi Chuan, Pa Kwa, all these kind of things, they all go back to the I Ching. When you look at about look at the theories of uh, Nei Dan as part of Chinese medicine or as a separate uh, part, however you want to look at it, then at that moment it still roots back on the I Ching. All these kind of things go back to that. So let's start discussing these things. I, I want to first remind you of a little bit of history, because the I Ching does not come out of nothing. And uh, we usually have two stories to tell about this. One is the, the stories of uh, He Tu and Luo Shu. These were uh, patterns that people found on the back of a turtle or a horse. And there are different variations on it. In an e earlier video, I already talked about that. And I mentioned it, and I'm going to pay more attention on it, because it is an important part of my translation of the encyclopedia of Yi Jing graphics and it is a very important part for us nowadays to understand uh, what things uh, mean and to understand the Yi Jing. And there's a very few people only who have read this in the West and even in China itself it is not a very well known text and I got that into my possession actually by an incident because when I brought it to the cash register at the bookstore in Beijing where I found it, they said like, huh, but this is not in our collection. So they charged me a very good price for it because money is money and they didn't understand the value of it. So lucky me. Um, in this uh, history of the aging, we can see that there are two histories. Uh, one is the 
uh, go to a lower school and that is where the encyclopedia starts with but another one is the idea that the yin and yang lines are devised by Fu Si. Fu Si is one of the three major gods of uh, Chinese culture god heroes you know, or god kings you can say and he created script he also did other things but let's just mention the script part and the script part was on the division of the whole line and the broken line and the whole line was seen as the line of a dragon moving and the broken line was seen as the yin while the other one was seen as yang and that these are two dragons fighting with each other and this is uh, an important part they're also mentioned as such in the yijing itself then from there he started division, dividing the lines in the eight basic markers of the I Ching, the Pa Kwa, uh, was the eight diagrams. And these eight diagrams were preceded by the four emblems of four images. And at the moment when we look at the Pa Kwa, uh, King Wen, and well, we'll talk about that later. So let's go on to the next part because we have a short introduction and we can go to the citations. The first one is I want to talk to you about the chapter Gu Ming in the Book of Shang. And it says there in the fourth month, and that is of a embryo, of a baby in the belly of a mom, uh, the Hun is being born. And the Hun is the heavenly envoy. There are in your body, there are two kinds of envoys. And at that time, uh, they only thought about one of each. There was one Hun and one Paw. The Hun was living in the liver and the Paw was living in the lungs. And these were envoys of heaven and earth. And they helped you to realize certain kind of things. So at the moment when we talk about the Hun, we talk about our creative, mental and emotional potential. And there also lies, of course, the uh, creative potential to destroy ourselves and to destroy the world, which is at this moment a very powerful influence in the world. And at the moment when we look at the potential of the Hun because of morally correcting ourselves we also immediately have an understanding where the I Ching comes in already because that is what it is the I Ching is a learning treatise and a learning method to help you understand the correct moral choices in our lives which there are many to make every day so that means every day we can correct ourselves so going back to the text in the fourth month the Hun was born and the king was not surprised uh, he was watching the growth of the baby in his wife as a king you are supposed to be a sage king that means that you had to have an understanding of nature the world and so on because otherwise you could not rule this is very similar to the idea of the magi in persia who also were supposed to be mage kings and they had to first study magic what we nowadays call magic uh, to be able to become a ruler and uh, I'm assuming at this moment uh, for this that in China this was the case also. On the first day of the first month, the king went to the Tao River. The prime minister wore a crown and sat on the jade table. He summoned Tai Bao Shuang, Ruo, Rei Po, Tong Po, Bi Gong, Wei Ho, uh, Mao Gong, Shi Shi, Hu Chen, Bai Yin, and Yu Shi. These were all important ministers within his uh, kingdom. The king said, Allah, my illness is getting worse. I am dying and I am afraid that I will not be able to succeed you as promised. And I will now teach you carefully. In the past, King Wen and King Wu, they spread glory and they lay down the teachings. If you are following, if you are following them without violating uh, them and their ideas, of course, also that's included uh, or implied, uh, you will be able to achieve the great destiny. You who are in the future should respectfully welcome the majesty of heaven and inherit the great teachings of uh, Wen and Wu. You dare not go beyond these rules. And today I have been sick and I am afraid that you will not wake up and realize it. it you should follow my words. Respectfully protect Yuan Tao, that was his child, and help people in difficulty. You see that what he mentions are two kings, Wu and uh, Wen. And these are the ones who also devised the I Ching as we know it, in the sense that they developed the Pakwa into the 64 hexagrams that we know, and also they wrote the text of the 
names of the hexagrams and uh, they devised the line text and the importance of the method of reading the lines and understanding them. And this is, of course, what was transmitted to them all the way from 4C to the present. And this part of understanding the I Ching is a very important part. Because what it says is like, look, if you do not focus towards heaven as the major source of influence and the major importance in our way of ruling, then at that moment you will start ruling from your own personal selfish perspective. And if you do not look at heaven, then at that moment your results as a ruler are going to be disastrous for the world. So ruling from a selfish perspective is by all means very bad. In our current world we see that there are dictators and all kinds of other people who are trying to rule for the the glory and the wealth of being the boss of a particular kind of country and in general you see that rulers also they try to dress themselves in the same that they do this for the people that they try to appear to be virtuous and not uh, a danger to society as it is unfortunately of course that is not the case and it is also difficult to understand if somebody is making a decision on the basis of selfish uh, means or on the basis of understanding the world and of course we have science and we have economics and we have all kind of other things which are very important in our private lives also we have to deal with a lot of people in our environment that we have to try to convince uh, to do the right thing including ourselves so to convince yourself to do the right thing is not the easiest one say for instance you are addicted to eating or you're addicted to uh, anger or you're addicted to gambling or watching tv or watching your phone all the time and uh, all these kind of things there are things that in our minds we actually know that they're immoral to keep on doing in the, in the fre frequency that we do them but still it is very hard to eventually come to the decision to actually stop and also to actually do this so that means that in our life as a whole we gradually become weaker and weaker and we delve our own graves as a result of that because all these things that we do according to the I Ching, they are going to undermine us and they're going to make that we are on the wrong moral side of history, our history, our story. So that means that the I Ching in that sense has to help you understand the nature of your life and face heaven and as a result of it make the right decisions. Heaven is not God. This is something that people very often misunderstand and that is why a lot of people are afraid to admit that Fo focusing on heaven is an important part of the I Ching because they are afraid to see that as God because in Christianity heaven is the place where God lives and yes in Chinese culture there are gods in heaven but that gods there are not of the same importance as the God is here in Christianity so that is a very important thing to understand the way of watching the universe as a whole in the Chinese culture, Taoism specifically also, is much more materialistic than ours. But they're also fair in the sense that they're not trying to deny the reality of things as they are. And the reality of things as they are is usually our self-compromising -com uh, behavior uh, through which we start getting stuck into uh, behaviors which are not beneficial for our development and that might be seen as good choices even though they are bad choices. The I Ching talks about that one too, by the way. That means that all the texts that we find in the I Ching, they are there to correct us and to find the way back to heaven. And there's always two directions. There is the way towards the right, the rightness, the being right, on the right side of things and there's the way towards the other side this is not about good or evil dark or light or anything like that as christianity and islam have developed but they are the way of bringing yourself to a healthier lifestyle and also therefore a longer and happier life or you know ending your life looking back at great meals great parties and dying with alzheimer and parkinson or something like this uh, of course, uh, there are many ways through which we can destroy ourselves and some of the ways we have no control over. This is also what the I Ching clarifies. He says, look, this is what is important and there is what is important is that we regulate the world and that we order the world in such a way that we 
can live uh, smooth lives. And smooth lives, that sense, is the source of happiness. Because at the moment we have no turbulence, we become empty on the inside. When we are empty on the inside, we don't have any complaints. It's the same like when we talk about the chi. When the body has chi, that means the body doesn't feel that much. You know, it only feels the things that it has to do, but it doesn't have any spectacular sensations. It is not happy, it is not sad, it is not anything of the things that normally people hold on to to make themselves feel important. Their misery, their happiness, all these kind of things, they give you a sense of identity. So in that sense for the aging, your personal character, the characteristics of what makes you are the causes of your problems. After all, people are reactive beings. We are not the origin of things. So that means that we live in a continuous codependency with things. And this is what the I Ching actually addresses and on which the I Ching is based. So now let's go to the second citation. The second citation is, as I suggested, based on Mozze. Mozze is, of course, a very famous uh, philosopher and was uh, you can basically say the counterforce towards Confucianism. And Confucianism did its best to bury its ideas because these ideas were the things that the people believed. And the most important part, what Confucianism tried to create, was a belief in the state and the emperor and the hierarchy of society and the bureaucracy of society as a harmonizing force in the world. And this uh, bureaucracy, of course, is a harmonizing force because they dampen the effects of crazy rulers. Um, and that means that a ruler that is able to replace bureaucracy with uh, yes and no sayers as he pleases, of course, is a country that is out of balance. And therefore you see that repression and all these kind of things, they are the result of bureaucracy that has gone wrong. So society as a whole also has found an answer to bureaucracy to create space for our worst nightmares. Um, at the moment, when we look at the Mozart, he proposed a worldview which was sort of pyramidical shape where heaven was on the top and there were divisions of three and he said the best government also is based on that. So that's also why you see in uh, Taoism, you see three gods on the top and each of these gods, they have assistance and so on. And this you get a larger and larger hierarchy and also the different Taoist uh, religions or sects uh, are also using very often this kind of structure through which uh, we can say we are, um, how do you say, uh, ruling uh, in a particular kind of division. Because when you rule in the form of three, like in the and each diagram has three lines, then you can continuously see there is a negotiation going on and that actually creates sort of kind of a balance because you have to remain rational to be able to do something right. And the Pakwa, they show to a large degree that dominance can be very disastrous, can be good, but can also be very disastrous. So there's a duality in things. And this is what Dao uh, what the Dao De Jing and what also Taoism as a whole also uh, professed. But he says in the chapter, The Undefeated, today Sufu is a king who likes to attack. And he also embellishes his words, saying that he is not a disciple. That means that he thinks that he is making his own thoughts. You can imagine how amazing that was in that time. And it is still crazy now. If you think you are your own words, then that is not right. I think it is unjust to attack, Mozart said, and it is not a gain if you attack. In the past, you conquered the seedlings, and Tang attacked Jie, and King Wu attacked the Zhou. Why are all these established as sage kings? And Tse um, uh, Mozart said, you didn't understand what I said. So it's very important that, he that you understand what he says, and we're going to talk about that. You didn't understand the reason why I was attacked. The sun comes out at night and there is a rain of blood uh, for three dynasties. If dragons are born in the temples and dogs cry in the market, the sky is full of ice. The ground is full of springs and the grains are changing. The people are in great spirits and there were seedlings. Four lightning currents were used to lure them and there was a god with a human face and a bird's body. Ro Jin was there to serve him and the arrow showed auspiciousness of the seedlings. The Miao army was in chaos, and then there was a lot of chaos. 
And since you had conquered the three seedlings, they were able to turn them into mountains and rivers. There were no objects above and there were no objects below. And the rule system was great. However, the gods and the people did not violate it. When the world was... And so the world was peaceful at that time. And that is why you wanted to conquer the seedlings. Uh, it was built to the hand of King Jia of Sha. And there was a decree from heaven. The sun and the moon were not coming at all times and the cold and the heat were coming the grains were scorched to death ghosts were calling the country and grains were singing for more than 10 nights Tian Nai ordered Tang to go to Jian Palace to receive Xia's great order Xia De is in great chaos now that he is dead his fate is up to heaven if he does go to punish him you will be embarrassed. Tang Yen dared to lead his people, so the village had a realm of summer. The emperor sent Yin to violently destroy the city of Yu Xia, and a little god came and said, Xia De is in great chaos. Go and attack it. I will definitely make you miserable. Since I have been ordered by heaven, the heavenly mandate merges with the fire in the northwest corner of the city of Xia. The soup served to Jack to conquer the Xia dynasty, which belonged to the princess. He recommended the decree of heaven to spread it to all directions, but no prince in the world dared to disobey him. Uh, the thing is with the soup, the king was murdered. So this is actually the case. So what uh, Monza actually says here, because it goes on for uh, quite a lot of other text, but what Monza says here is basically that the I Ching, uh, diagnosis the understanding of how heaven works and how the world works is when it was being denied leading to chaos and disorder and war and distrust and so on and so on and at the moment when uh, it is obeyed and when it is followed not obeyed in the sense of like authoritarian but obeyed in the sense that we will pay attention to it and we understand it and we follow its principles then at that moment uh, we can bring order and peace to the world and as a result of that everybody is happy er. the world itself is based on the ordering of things and when he talked about the creation of the mountains and the rivers he actually also talks about the symbols that are relevant within the I Ching and these I Ching symbols are the Pa Kwa the symbol of fire, water, uh, heaven, earth, uh, mountain, thunder, uh, clouds and wind these symbols they have a meaning and uh, that is very important at the moment when we are doing rituals in uh, Taoism then at that moment we pay attention to these symbols and they are used in two different kind of ways because these symbols are also the nature of particular kind of demonic forces you should not see demonic necessarily as evil because gods are also demons but they are creatures that are able to enhance their power to do good uh, and evil if you use them in the wrong kind of way so that is what is important and at the moment when you see that uh, you can use these powers uh, to let them fight for you that means basically like when you're doing feng shui you are trying to harness these demons for your environment and at the moment when you do a ritual you go through the different stages of the development of the parkwa and you follow a particular kind of order and you go face these kind of demons uh, and you face your own personal growth in a particular kind of situation to be able to go to heaven and to talk to the highest gods and uh, either report something or try to ask them for doing something to correct a mistake like for instance not raining or uh, solving your problems of poverty in your country at the moment when we look at these symbols for instance the fire symbol which is very often seen as the big eye in heaven which you could also see as the buddha eye uh, that is usually facing the highest god in heaven uh, which is the wisdom of reality the thunder is very often the symbol of the ancestors so at the moment when you see both at the moment when you face the thunder you face the voice of the ancestor and the wisdom of the ancestors which come from the earth and they rise up so they come from the demon world from the ghost world from below and they give you support and this is where feng shui is based on while the will of heaven is based on the sun and when we look at other symbols like the earth, the earth is the soil everywhere and the soil is just toiling and creating plants, trees, uh, 
giving a home to animals and so on. So this is what the earth is doing. This is the earth is the always giving mother who is always following the need of nature and the will of heaven. Then when we look at the mountain, this is where we climb up to be able to be close to heaven and to communicate with heaven better. But a mountain is also an obstruction, like a door, but it's also an obstruction in the sense that when it rains, the rain can come off the mountain and flush the landscape. So a mountain is already like a double feeling about all kinds of things. Of course, your communication with the ancestors can be wrong and you can get the wrong interpretation and with the gods the same. Uh, the earth can be abused by uh, withholding uh, the things that are necessary for her to be fertile. Um, likewise, when we look at the clouds, the clouds are bringing rain. And if the clouds are accumulating too much, then at that moment they will bring us thunderstorms, certainly in relationship with the anger of the ancestors. So this is how people saw these things. And the wind, in that sense, is the wind going through the leaves, which is a symbol of life, but also of ghosts. And therefore, wind is a very important part of the control of things like water. Water is in itself a life-giving force and that is therefore the symbol of power. So when we talk in Feng Shui about wind and water, we talk about the control of power of nature uh, in the form of ghosts and the power of heaven because water comes from heaven, of course. And at the moment when we uh, see these kind of things, uh, we see that we are continuously surrounded by these things. And the point is to recognize these powers active in your own life. So that means that through the I Ching, you learn to see the world around you in the form of these eight uh, imaginary symbols. And you learn to recognize them and you learn to see how their interplay is and you learn how to recognize these things. And then that brings me to a question of a student actually about something else. And it was actually not exactly about something else. It was about the standard values for yin, yang, pa, kwa, and so forth and so forth. And there are lists about standard values. But the problem is that your life is not a standard value set. That means that you always have to find your own interpretation and the standard lists that are being set there are basically... Um, Moments where they recognized a particular kind of value, but it is not always like that. So when you become a stickler and you see it as a mechanical thing, that means that you do not use the hoon inside yourself that we talked about earlier. Because the hoon has to help you to create that association between the theoretical framework of the I Ching and the actual framework of your life. At the moment when you see things as a rule, like you very often see people doing Yi Ching or about in Feng Shui or in uh, astrology, then at that moment they basically become technocrats, they become technicians. And as a result that they have no feeling for reality and no feeling for reality, that means usually that people are going to suffer. You are going to suffer and the people around you are going to suffer. So when you use the I Ching, you have to continuously be creative but you also have to make sure that you use your capacity to meditate and to practice and to study the theoretical framework as a whole to create the kind of mental space that you need to be able to correctly interpret things and not to make up things on the basis of your emotions and your fear. This is why in Taoism and also in Buddhism, they always emphasize that you have to develop your awareness but you also have to calm your emotions because at the moment when your emotions are not calm and at that moment your thinking is going to be colored by that because your thoughts are an extension of your emotions and your awareness. So your awareness is something that you react on because you see something, say you see a tree and there are seven cats in it and then you think like, oh, cute cats, I'm going to save these cats. And that is not necessary because these cats are there to hunt birds. So at the moment when you try to save the cats, you actually chase away their food. And that means you go against nature. Thank you very much. I think this was a very interesting topic. If you like to see more of these kind of things, ask my friend.